Okay, welcome back. Now, uh, probably before we move forward, we should save this thing because it would be a shame to lose all of our work. So I'm going to say save. It's going to ask me where to put it. I'm going to put it in Fin780 Online. And we're going to call it Baldwin Company Example. Save. So save early, save always. Okay, now let's see. Where do we go from here? They tell us that networking capital starts, and it always starts in time zero because you have to have money to get things rolling. So management determines that an immediate Investment in working capital of 10,000 is required. So we're going to put 10,000 there. Got to format that as numbers. And then they tell us that going forward from that, the working capital for each subsequent year will be 10% of sales. So I'm going to say equal to 0 0.10 times, and then I'm just going to select the sales in dollars for that year. I'm going to drag that on over. So there we go. Now you can see what they use for networking capital in, uh, on, in table 8.1. Now there's one thing that we need to cover here though. Networking capital at the end of a project is always zero because that money always flows out at the very last moment of the project. And so we're going to say zero right there. And in Excel, when you put in a zero, it looks like a minus sign. Don't let that freak you out. But otherwise, all of our numbers are exactly as shown in Table 8.1 with the difference of the price rounding that we did or didn't do. Okay, so there's networking capital. Now, I think we need to figure out some depreciation so we can because um, yeah, we need to know for our tax purposes and so in order to do that we need to know what depreciation schedule to use and we've been told to use the five-year recovery period class from MACR, so the modified accelerated cost recovery system that's in table 8.3 now you'll notice there are six years there that's because of something called the half-year convention and so in theory there's a half-year depreciation at the beginning a half-year at the end and so four plus two halves is five years but there will always be six decimal places now something you can see here in fact let's go ahead and type those in let's just say for year zero of course there's not going to be any and in fact we'll just leave it blank uh, beyond that we've got 0.2 in year one, 0.32 in year two, 0.192 in year three, 0.1152 in year four, and 0.1152 in year five. Now there's actually one more, 0 0.0576. Um, we won't be able to do that because our project only lasts five years. This also tells us that we're not going to be able to fully depreciate the bowling ball machine. We're going to have 5.76% left. How do I know that? If I add all of those decimals together from the five-year recovery period class, I should get 1.0. But because I'm not going to use the last one, I know I'm going to be 5.76% short of actually fully depreciating. So can I figure a depreciation now? Well, all I have to do is take this multiplied by the bowling ball machine cost. Now, once again, I want that to be a fixed reference, so I'm going to hit F4. It puts those two dollar signs in there, and we're good to go. And then I'm going to drag this across. Okay, so there's our depreciation, and I do believe that the bowling ball is the only depreciable asset in this whole thing. And so far, our depreciation is looking good. Now, your book does accumulated depreciation, which can be helpful in figuring out book value, or we could also do book value this way. Book value 
of the bowling ball machine. And all we have to do is we reference the bowling ball machine's historic cost or the initial cost at year zero. And then every year after that, the book value is simply the previous book value minus the depreciation for that period. And so now I should be able to just drag this across. And there we go. Look at that. We've got $5,760 left. And we said that 5.76% of the uh, value would be not depreciated. So that fits in perfectly with what we've been seeing so far. Okay, now that book value of the bowling ball machine will need it eventually, but not right now. I think now we have enough information that we could actually calculate um, net income. Let's do that. In fact, just to make things a little cleaner, I'm going to go ahead and start another section down here where we calculate net income. And we'll start out with our sales revenues. And that's easy enough. We just link to these cells up here. I'm going to drag that across. And it should be identity. Oh, that's the wrong thing. That's not revenues at all. Let me try again. Equals. equals sales in dollars. That's what we're looking for. Then I'm going to drag this across. Very good. Should be exactly the same as what we see up here, only now what we need to do is... There we go. That looks better. Okay. Then we need to be able to subtract out our operating costs. And we've got those up above. Drag those over, and then we've got depreciation. It's up above too, right here, and drag that across. And we should be able to use all that to calculate income before taxes. It's very simple. I'm just going to say equal to that minus operating costs minus depreciation. Hit enter. I'm going to drag that across and we're looking pretty good here. Our numbers are really, really close to what the book's doing. The only difference is because of that rounding thing. So now we can figure our taxes. Well, how do you figure taxes? It's the income before taxes multiplied by our corporate tax rate, which is up here. Now, once again, I want to fix that cell reference, so I'm going to hit F4. And that fixes the cell reference. And then I can drag that over too. Okay, I think now we are ready to calculate our net income. And that is simply income before taxes minus taxes. I'm gonna drag that all the way over. And that gives us net income. Now, is net income what we're truly interested in? The answer is no. What we're really interested in is something called operating cash flow, or OCF. And that is simply net income plus depreciation. Now, why are we adding depreciation back? Because depreciation is not a real cash flow. It doesn't represent cash out of your pocket. Therefore, we can add it back and get operating cash flow. And let's see here. Those numbers look very good. Uh, you can check, check our work here looking at table 8.4 in the book. Okay, now uh, that's actually, let's go ahead and bold that. And the reason I do that is because what we're working toward is something called cash flow from assets. And cash flow from assets is simply operating cash flow minus net capital spending minus changes in net worth and capital. And speaking of, I think we can do changes in net worth and capital now too. So let's go ahead and figure that. I'm going to recopy the years down here. And I'm going to say uh, net worth and capital. And I'll just say equal. I'm going to reference those cells up there. 
It's okay to repeat stuff. You don't have to, but it's okay to do so. And then we're going to do something called change in networking capital. Um, how do we do that? Well, first of all, let's use a correct symbol here. So I'm going to say insert symbol. And the Greek symbol for change is delta. So that's what we're going to select. Say close. And then I'm going to put NWC. Now, why does it do weird stuff like that? I have no idea, but this will work for us. Okay, so in the first year, the change is simply the amount, or not the first year, times zero, because that's money we're going to have to invest in this project straight away. Then the change is merely the current year minus the previous year. And so there's no change in year one. And then we have to add another 6,320. And then we have to add another 8,650. And then it starts to go down. Why does the networking capital go down? Remember that it's a percentage of sales. And that's realistic because what goes into networking capital? We're talking about the amount of cash you've got to have on hand for the project, the amount of inventory, the accounts receivable. That all goes in there. And then the accounts uh, payable, of course, is, is subtracted, but all those things should go down as production ramps down. And then at the very end, the rest of that money should flow back to us. So we can look at our uh, changes in, in uh, networking capital. I forget what table that's in. Oh, there we go. In table 8.1, they show change in networking capital. Now, if you'll notice, there's our negative, one minor positive, and positive one minor negative. We're going to use the formula CFFA is equal to OCF minus change in networking capital minus net capital spending, whereas they're adding these things together. So that's why their sign's different. So don't let that freak you out. Okay, well, hey, that's we've got two of the three things done that we need. That's pretty cool. Um, if you want to bold stuff, you just hit Control B and it's bolded and we're good to go. So the one last thing we need to figure out is the uh, net capital spending. So I'm going to do the years one more time. Uh, there we go. And so we've got a couple of things that we've got capital spending here for. We've got the bowling ball machine, and we've got the building. So let's go ahead and do BB machine and the building. And what we're shooting for here is net cap, called net capital spending. And so these numbers will be positive when we're spending money and negative when we're getting money back. And so the bowling ball machine we know that it costs $100,000 up front. So I'm going to reference that cell, go to the top, reference that cell, bowling ball machine. There it is. Hit enter. And then um, that machine doesn't cost us anything, uh, but we eventually get to sell it back in year five. Now, this is going to get a little hairy. We have to figure something called the after-tax salvage value. And it's going to be money coming back at us, so that's negative spending. And so let's start out with equals negative. I'm going to open the parentheses. Then I'm going to go select the market value of the machine at the end of the time period. And that's this 30,000. And then I'm going to subtract open parentheses. And let's see what else we got here. Oh, I need to do this market value again subtract the book value at that same time period. Where is that? Well, I know we've got it here. Here it is. Okay, so there's the book value. And I'm going to multiply that by the tax rate. Multiply by the tax rate. And I'll explain why I'm doing this here in a second. Let's see if that worked for us. It did. Okay. So what we're doing here is we have over depreciated this asset. We've depreciated it down to 5,760. In truth, we can sell it for 30,000. That means we have underpaid our taxes to the tune of 30,000 minus 5760 
times the tax rate. And so we're going to have to subtract out that extra tax we owe. That's what the second half of this equation is all about. This piece right here is the taxes that we owe. And that part up front is the money that we get in hand when we sell it. So we're going to take the money we get in hand and subtract out the taxes we owe to get that last piece called the after-tax salvage value. Now the building is a little different. Um, the building, when you do these opportunity cost things, you consider that cost up front and then you consider it to be that money all comes back to you at the end. Why? Because you have the opportunity to sell this building once the bowling ball machine operation is out of it. Now notice some of these are uh, show negative signs and some show uh, parentheses. Couldn't really tell you why that is. There we go. Uh, the parentheses, that's called accounting notation, by the way. Okay, so let's see if there's anything else here in that capital spending wise that we need to be concerned about. Okay, it looks like we're good to go. So I'm going to go ahead and calculate net capital spending, NCS, and uh, I'm going to bold that. I'm going to bold all these two. Bold. And we're just going to add those two rows together like that. And I'm going to drag that across. And now I think we are ready to figure out cash flow from assets. So let's one more time the years here. Oh, don't want to do that. Let's uh, insert a row there. Very good. Okay, now cash flow from assets. Oh, it's already bold. There we go. It's just equal once again to OCF minus change in net working capital minus NCS. We're going to drag that across. And those are cash flow from assets. Your book may call this total cash flow from project in table 8.4. And it looks like our numbers still look great. Now, what do we do with this cash flow from assets? Well, it's what we, we set out to do all along, and that is to calculate the net present value. So I want to figure out the net present value for this project. And it's a little tricky because the NPV um, function in Excel doesn't work right. But I think we need to do one last thing. We need to have up here, actually let's do it down here. Insert. Let's put a discount rate in here. That's the rate at which we're going to have to uh, discount our cash flows. And just to start out with, let's say 10%. Because in the book, they really don't give us one. They, they make you go through a range of them. So I'm going to do that. Okay, we're ready to go. Equal to NPV. The first thing you click on, you see how it says rate there? We're going to click on the rate. We're going to put a comma. Then we're going to select the cash flow starting at time 1. Because the NPV function in Excel is actually wrong. It gives you the present value of cash flow starting at time 1 at time 0. It doesn't give you net present value. It's because Excel was written by computer nerds and not finance people. And then what we're going to do is just add back that initial negative cash flow and that perfectly meets our uh, definition of net present value. And I'm going to bold that. Okay, so if we look in your book on Table 8.4, they say the NPV of this project at 10% is $51,588. We have $51,590.11, so we're really close. The only difference is the rounding that we did on the prices and costs up front, or the rounding that we didn't do, the rounding that they did. Okay, so what does this tell us? At 10%, we would take this project because it has a positive NPV. And we can go even higher, 15%. It still has a positive NPV. So this is a pretty robust kind of situation here. Okay, so that is how you do a net present value project on Excel. And uh, feel free to email me with questions if you don't understand something that I did here. Of course, you could always watch the video again if you're so inclined.